All right, so now we're going to take a look at chapter 24 where we're going to look at the digestive system. When we're looking at the digestive system, guys, we're looking at the GI tract, which is known as the alimentary canal. Um, it's a continuous tube running through the ventral body cavity, that's the front body cavity, from your mouth to your anus. Um, a lot of organisms um, are not a tube in a tube like we are. When we consume food, it stays within the digestive system until it leaves our body. Whereas other, anim or other animals are not like this, where they have a mouth that acts also as the anus. Okay, so we have one tube and we're, we have what we call the alimentary canal. Now looking at the alimentary canal, we have some special structures that play a key role um, that are the connecting um, uh, components from the mouth to the anus. You have the mouth, the pharynx, which is the throat, the esophagus, which connects the throat to the stomach, the stomach, the small intestine, and the large intestine. We then have some accessory structures, and these accessory structures are going to help um, with the digestive process, like your teeth and your tongue and your salivary glands, which are all located in the mouth region, the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas. So what we're gonna do is we go through these notes is we are going to talk about, in general, the tissues of the digestive system, then we're gonna look at each of the structures more specifically. Now, one thing to note from the mouth down to the anus, which is the end of the large intestines, this can be what we call five to seven meters long. In a meter, guys, is about three feet. Um, each meter is about three feet. So guys, your digestive system from your mouth to your anus is anywhere between 15 to 21 feet long. Um, so it's a really kind of long structure that's kind of compacted and twisted into a small space. Um, gastroenterology is the study of the stomach and the intestine, and so if you go to a gastroenterologist, a lot of times it's to um, look at your GI tract or your digestive system. So before we get started, we want to first look at the digestive process as a whole. When we're looking at this digestive process, the first thing is ingestion. You have to actually take the food into your mouth. So that's the first thing that has to take place. Then the food needs to be able to move from the mouth down to the anus. And it does this through a series of alternating contractions and relaxations of smooth muscles throughout your GI tract. This is called peristalsis. We also see that secretion plays a big role, secretion of water, um, HCLs, hydrochloric acid, buffers, enzymes, they all are going to mix with the food you take in to help you with um, the next process, which is digestion. Digestion is the process of breaking down the larger molecules, those macromolecules that we learned about back in the chemistry chapter in Anatomy 1, um, like complex carbohydrates, proteins, fats, nucleic acids. They're going to help break those down so that your cells can use the parts. Um, there's two types of digestion. There's mechanical digestion. This is gonna be the chewing, the churning, the mixing of the secretions. Um, and then chemical digestion, once we mix all the secretions in there with the food, it's going to allow for hydrolysis. Hydrolysis is the breaking down of these particular structures using water and also um, these enzymes speeding up that process. The next step is absorption. So once we break these down into their building blocks like monosaccharides, amino acids, nucleic acids, and fatty acids, we want to be able to, um, once we break these down into the monosaccharides, the amino acids, the nucleotides, and the fatty acids, we want to be able to move them into the bloodstream, into the lymph in order to be delivered to the cells to be used. And this is the absorption stage. Then whatever could not be digested that we can't get anything else from needs to be eliminated from the body and this is the defecation step. And so there's actually six kind of steps in the digestive process. Now, when we look at the GI tract as a whole, we're going to notice that there's going to be some similar tissues um, that are present. We'll see some adjustments to these tissues based on the function of each of the organs. However, these layers of the GI tract are kind of similar in each of them. And so the first layer is called the mucosa. The mucosa is the inner lining of the lumen of the GI tract. Now, guys, lumen means hole or opening. So when you look at the GI tract, it's a tube. So it's talking about this innermost part of the tube is the mucosa. It's a mucosa membrane. Um, a lot of the cells here have the villi, okay, the extensions um, to help move food 
um, for absorption, things like that. The next layer out from the mucosa is the submucosa. This is made of areolar connective tissue. Um, it has many blood vessels, nerve plexuses, and glands and lymph tissue. Um, this is going to be the area where absorption is going to take place. Um, this is also the area where the nerves are going to come in contact to either speed up digestion or slow down digestion, depending on what kind of state your body is in in the autonomic nervous system. The next layer is the muscularis. Um, the muscularis contains muscle in some of the areas in your body that is made of skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle, remember, is voluntary. You have control over it consciously. This is the mouth, um, the pharynx, part of your throat, the upper esophagus, and also the external anal sphincter at the opposite end. Um, the rest of the GI tract, though, this layer is smooth muscle. That's involuntary. It's a subconscious um, control. Um, of, from the esophagus down to the internal anal sphincter, um, it's made of inner sheets of circular fibers as well as circular fibers as well as um, longitudinal fibers to allow the movement of the food down the tubes. The last layer is called the serosa. The serosa is actual part part of the what we call visceral peritoneum. If we recall back from the tissue chapter, we talked about membranes, and these membranes, um, there's three of them. There's the pleura, the pericardium, and the peritoneum. They have two layers. Okay, they form two layers. The layer that's up against the actual organ is called the visceral. Okay, the layer that's on um, uh, uh, that lines the body cavity is called the parietal. So you have the parietal layer, and then you have the visceral layer. The space in between is going to contain fluid. The whole point of this um, secreting this lubricating fluid is so that when these two structures rub together, rubber hands together, it creates friction. It's to decrease that friction. Now the peritoneum is a very unique. Um, serous membrane. Um, it's the largest serous membrane in the body and it covers multiple organs. Um, the pericardium only covers the heart, the pleura only covers the lungs, but the peritoneum is going to cover a lot of different organs. Um, the parietal peritoneum lines the abdominal cavity, the visceral peritoneum covers the different digestive organs. Uh, the peritoneal cavity is a space between which contains peritoneal fluid. Um, the peritoneum contains many folds. Because it's covering many different organs, you're gonna see that it folds between each of these organs. And they contain lots of blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, and nerves. Now some organs though are not actually in the peritoneum. They're not part of that. They're not covered with it. And so they are considered what we call retroperitoneal because they are behind it. Um, they're not actually covered with the peritoneum. Peritonitis is an inflammation of the peritoneum. It is a very painful inflammation because it's actually covering multiple organs so it can cause some major issues and it could possibly be fatal. Alright, so now what we're going to do is we're going to start from the mouth and move our way down. We're going to look at the structures of each of these. And we look at the anatomy side, and then we're going to look at how they function in digestion for the physiology side. All right, so when we're going to start with the oral cavity, that's the mouth. It's the buccal cavity, and it's used for ingestion. Um, when you have and you open up your mouth between your lips, your cheeks, your teeth, your gum, it's called the vestibules. Okay, it's the opening area. The foxes is opening on each side of the uve uvula. The uvula is going to be that muscular process that dangles in the back when you open your mouth and you go, ah, it dangles in the back. Um, that's actually connected to your soft pellets palate so that when you swallow, it actually moves up to block your nasal cavity so food and drink doesn't go up into your nose. Now we know this doesn't happen 100% of the time because if you um, are drinking something or eating something and then you laugh because of it or some, if something funny happened, food or even liquid can get up into your nose it burns it bothers you that sort of thing because it's not supposed to go that way it's supposed to go down the throat but the uvula is going to help with that we also then have the tongue the tongue forms the floor of the oral cavity it is made of skeletal muscles that are covered with the mucous membrane um, there are what we call extrinsic and intrinsic muscles that move the tongue to allow you to chew, swallow, but even talk with your speech. Um, your tongue has to move in different ways when you make different sounds. Um, the underside of the tongue has the lingual frenulum. This is a fold of mucous membrane that limits your tongue's movement. It doesn't allow it to be able to just like roll out. Um, it determines how much you can stick your tongue out. Individuals who are tongue-tied a lot of times
sometimes this is really tight and they may need to have it clipped in order to help them be able to speak properly. Um, or they may have like a speech impediment and, and speech therapy may be helpful. Um, the upper surface of the tongue, the top part of the tongue has papillae on it. Um, some of these papillae do contain taste buds and when we get to the chapter on special senses, we'll talk about how these taste buds work and allowing you to taste different things in your food. Another structure that's really going to be important in the um, mouth region are the salivary glands. They are going to secrete saliva. The saliva is a lubricating fluid. It helps dissolve food. Um, it starts chemical digestion of carbohydrates. So when we first look at this, not only are we breaking down the food physically into smaller pieces, the saliva also contains some um, secretions, some enzymes, um, amylase, that are going to help us start breaking down the carbohydrates. This is why like, when you chew gum, the flavor doesn't last forever. Eventually, there's no flavor to it because you've broken down all the sugars. There's three pairs of major salivary glands. Um, carotid glands are going to be inferior and anterior to your earlobe, so right in here between your skin and your masseter. Um, when these get inflamed, peritidis is inflammation of these glands, and this happens a lot of times with patients who have mumps, and so you'll see that they have like a chipmunk type structure here because these get really inflamed. Um, the most inferior group are the submandibular, so they're below your mandible. If you'll recall, this is your mandible. And then you also have your sublingual glands, which are right underneath your tongue. We also see that teeth are a big part of helping with the digestion in the mouth, and these are called the dentes. The dentes, guys, this is why you go see a dentist for your teeth. They function in mechanical digestion because of chewing. Now, each tooth has some special structures. They're going to have a crown. This is above the gum line. We also see that the root, and that's going to be below the gum line, it's coated in with cementum to help hold it in place. Um, and this is like a bone-like structure. And we also see that then there's the neck. This holds the crown to the root, and it's right at the gum line. Um, now, a tooth is composed mostly of dentin. It's calcified connective tissue, so it's kind of similar to bone structure. But then it is covered with enamel, and enamel, guys, is stronger than bone. The problem with enamel, though, is it does not get replaced, and so it can be worn off, and depending on what you eat, like if, things, if you eat a lot of acidic things and stuff like that, it can wear it down. Um, your teeth are located in tooth sockets, and they're called the alveolus. They contain a periodontal ligament, which helps hold each of your teeth in place, and that is a fibrous connective tissue lining. And you learned about these particular um, markings in the bones of the mandible and the maxilla when we talked about bones in Anatomy 1. You have two dentations. Um, these are two sets of teeth in each person's life. The first are called the deciduous. These are your primary teeth or your baby teeth. You have a total of 20 of them. Um, and then you have your permanent teeth. That's the secondary teeth and there are 32. Now this 32 number does include your wisdom teeth. And you have four wisdom teeth. And so technically if you took those out of the picture, there's 28, which means you still get eight more teeth besides your wisdom teeth from your um, baby teeth to your permanent. So let's take a look at these teeth and kind of like their shape and what they do. So there's four different types of teeth based on shape. The first group is the incisors. They're the frontmost teeth. They're used to cut food. You have two pairs upper and two pairs lower okay, um, of your incisors. The next group is the cuspids. These are your canines. They're used to tear or shred food. You have one pair upper and one pair lower. Um, your canines are like your little sharp teeth. Um, we also then see the premolars. These are called bicuspids. They're used for crushing and grinding food. Now in deciduous or baby teeth, there are no bicuspids. So that's where we're missing most of those teeth. Um, in the permanent teeth though, you have two pairs upper and two pairs lower and that's an equal for eight. So this is where you get your eight more teeth when we're talking about going from 20 to 28. Um, to go to the 32 though, you do have an extra set of molars when we're looking at the wisdom teeth. So molars are used for crushing and grinding your food. Um, when baby teeth, you have two pairs, upper and lower. In permanent teeth, there's three pairs, the third pair being your wisdom teeth. Now, the mouth, with its structure, with the teeth, the salivary glands, the tongue, um, all of that, we're going to now look at, at how it functions, the physiology. So the first thing that the mouth is going to be useful for is what we call mastication, and this is the chewing. This is going to help with the ingestion of your food. You mix your food with the saliva. The tongue helps form what we call a food bolus, which allows to help you swallow. 
um, salivary amylase gets released to the enzyme to start the breakdown of polysaccharides, which are complex sugars, into simpler sugars, which are disaccharides. Deglutination is swallowing. This moves the bolus of food from your mouth to your stomach. Uh, if we don't chew enough, um, before we swallow something, we've all kind of done that before where you can feel it as it moves all the way down, especially like if it's chips and there's that sharp spot that's moving down. Um, this is why it's really important to chew and mix your food really good before you swallow. Deglutination receptors are in the back of your throat at the oropharynx. Oro means mouth, pharynx means part of the throat, and it detects the presence of the food. So then it sends an impulse to the deglutination center in your brainstem, the medulla and pons. Um, this causes a motor output from the brainstem causes the elevation of the uvula, which is going to cover the nose, the nasopharynx, so that food doesn't go up your nose. And it's also going to move your larynx up, which is right here where you talk, okay, the part that vibrates when you talk. It's going to move up with the epiglottis to cover your larynx, so that way food doesn't go down in your trachea and to your lungs. All right, and so it's to help protect when you swallow that it goes down the right tube, which will be the esophagus. So with the esophagus, guys, it's a muscular tube behind the trachea, and it contains uh, it connects the pharynx, which is the throat, to the stomach. It moves the bolus of food by peristalsis. There is no chemical digestion that happens here. Um, so pretty much the esophagus is only a connection. It's connecting your throat to your stomach. It contains an upper and lower uh, esophageal sphincter. These sphincters are help to help hold it closed so that when you get food to the stomach, it doesn't come back up. However, if they don't close completely once food enters the stomach and mixes with the acid, this can cause acid reflux where it comes up the sphincter causing what we call heartburn or burning sensation in the esophagus. Um, this is a big deal because the stomach has special structures that help it against the acid, but the esophagus does not. Um, and so that's kind of a big deal. Now, when you swallow, depending on the size of the bolus and what you're eating, it takes between four to eight seconds in order for food to get from your, um, your throat to your um, stomach. But liquids take about one second to get from your um, throat to your stomach. All right, so now let's talk about the stomach. The stomach is a kind of a J-shaped organ and it has four main regions to it. It has the cardia, which is the right uppermost region. This is just past the lower um, esophageal sphincter, so it's connected directly to the esophagus. We then see the fundus, which is the left uppermost part, the body, which is the middle curved portion of the stomach, and then the pylorus. The pylorus is the lower portion that actually connects to the small intestine and that it connects to what we call the duodenum, which is the first part of the small intestine. This connection between the stomach and the small intestine is due to what we call the pyloric sphincter. This is going to open and close between the stomach and the duodenum to allow passage of food from the stomach to the small intestine. Now one thing that's unique about the stomach um, and also the bladder, which we'll talk about in another chapter, is that it contains special folds called rugae, and these folds allow for greater distension. It allows it to expand, so when more food is entering into the stomach, it allows for expansion to take place. Just like when more urine enters the bladder, it can expand. And so this is a unique structure for the stomach and the uh, bladder. Now, taking a closer look microscopically at the cells that are part of the stomach, um, we see that there are going to be what we call gastric glands. These are located in gastric pits. Um, they're con they are con they are composed of simple columnar epithelial cells. So we're pulling terms out from chapter four back with tissues. Now in these particular kind of pits, we're gonna see that there are some chief cells. Chief cells are also known as zygogenic cells. They secrete pepsigen and lipase. These are two enzymes that are going to help with proteins. The pepsigen is gonna help with protein digestion, um, speeding that up, and lipase is gonna help the breakdown of fats. We also see parietal cells, or what we call oxidant, oxidant cells. These secrete hydrochloric acid and intrinsic factor. The hydrochloric acid is going to actually convert the pepsigen into pepsin. It's going to activate the enzyme so that it can do its job of breaking down proteins. But it's also there to help kill bacteria and unwanted things that get into your stomach. Okay, It's kind of almost like an immune system type structure. It also is going to release intrinsic factor. This is necessary for the absorption of vitamin B12. Um, 
you need this in order to take it, the B12 in. So sometimes people who have B12 deficiencies, it's not because they're not consuming enough B12. It could be that they are missing intrinsic factors. So that's something that would need to be tested. We also see there's mucus cells. The mucus cells secrete mucus, and this is to protect the stomach wall from the digestion. Since this, this acid is at a pH of two, it could corrode and eat away at tissues very easily. So the mucus helps protect the stomach. There's also G cells. G cells secrete gastrin. I told you when we did the um, endocrine system that we would see that there are other hormones that work in other types of um, systems, and this is one. Um, gastrin is a hormone involved in the digestive process, and what gastrin does is it stimulates more hydrochloric acid and pepsigenesin to be released. Um, this activates it into pepsin to be able to do its digestion of proteins, but it also increases stomach contraction, so the churning of the stomach, so it mixes all these secretions with the food that you took in. Um, gastric secretion is regulated by the nervous system and also other hormones which we'll talk about later. So what happens in the stomach? Well, first of all, we have mechanical digestion. This is that mixing, and there's this almost like peristaltic wave of the stomach as it moves and churns the food together. This leads to chemical digestion, where proteins are gonna start getting broken down here, because remember in the mouth, the carbohydrates start at the breakdown. They continue in the stomach, but now we have proteins that are being broken down. Uh, pepsin works best at a pH of two. That's why the acid is there. Lipase breaks down larger fats into triglycerides, that's what the TG stands for, monoglycerides, and then fatty acids. Um, only a few substances, though, get absorbed um, through the stomach wall, so there's not a lot of absorption that takes place here, but there is some. Um, water, okay, some water can actually be absorbed. Electrolytes, those are going to be kind of your charged ions like sodium, potassium, um, chlorine, things like that. Um, certain drugs like aspirin can be absorbed here, and this is why they can work a little quicker because they don't have to travel as far through the digestive system. And then also alcohol. This is why a lot of times I talk about you eating something while it, you drink alcohol because if it's mixed with the food, it's going to absorb slower than if it's just the alcohol itself being absorbed straight out of the stomach. Now, when we're talking about how the stomach kind of works and does its job, it actually starts before the food ever gets to the stomach. There are three phases of gastric digestion that we want to look at, and the first is the cephalic phase. If you'll recall, cephalic means like head. So this is before the food ever even enters the stomach. This is when you see food, you smell it, you taste it, um, you even think about certain types of food. This sends your um, autonomic nervous system with the parasympathetic system impulses to your stomach cells. This gets them to start secreting those different um, enzymes, the hydrochloric acid and mucus. Um, it also secretes gastrin into the blood, and this is going to help like, increase the churning and stuff like that, and that's why your stomach a lot of times will start growling. Um, if you're in a fight or flight situation, the sympathetic system starts to take over and it'll slow this process down. Um, if you'll remember, the parasympathetic is, is termed the rest and digest, whereas the sympathetic is the fight or flight. The next phase is that overlaps with the cephalic phase is the gastric phase. This is when the food actually reaches the stomach. So in the stomach, there's different receptors who know that food has been put into the stomach. And one of them are stretch receptors. Um, it causes it to stretch once food enters so that it knows that something has come in. Um, a lot of times with this is when, it, they'll tell you a lot of times when you're hungry to drink a glass of water first, this fools your stomach with the stretch receptors thinking that you gave it something. The only problem is it doesn't last too long because the chemio receptors inside your stomach realize there is no nutrients it's just the water and so it'll realize that pretty quick and then it'll start growling again um, but when we add any kind of food or water or liquid into our stomach it actually raises the pH and so when the pH raises this causes issues in digestion in the stomach so we need to release more hydrochloric acid in order to make those enzymes work so this causes the parasympathetic impulses to increase peristalsis movement and churning to increase and um, also releasing more acid to bring the acidity back down in order to allow digestion to take place. The last phase is the intestinal phase, and this is when the chyme, the chyme is the food and the secretions all mixed together and the stomach is going to enter the duodenum. 
um, stretch receptors and chemo receptors trigger the parasympathetic system um, to increase secretion of two hormones, secretin and CCK into the blood. What secretin does is it slows down gastric secretions in the stomach, so it tells the stomach, hey, you're done, you don't have to do any more, I want you to stop secreting stuff. CCK inhibits the stomach peristalsis, so it's, it allows the emptying to take place of the stomach. These same two hormones, though, are also going to go talk to the pancreas and the gallbladder and get them ready because they are going to add stuff to the small intestine once the food moves from the stomach into the duodenum. Now, when the stomach empties during gastric emptying, um, the stomach needs to be distended or full or it is stimulated by that hormone gastrin. Um, this pyloric sphincter will start to relax, so the sphincter that, that's between the stomach and the intestine will relax and open up so the food can pass through. Um, most food leaves the stomach within two to six hours after it's been ingested and how we move it is, of course, gravity is going to help, but we're going to contract from the esophageal sphincter down the stomach and contract and push the food out. We don't want to push from the middle because that would send the food both directions. We want to push from the top down. It's kind of like with a toothpaste. If you take and you push from the bottom and you roll the toothpaste up, it's going to keep pushing it forward. If you squeeze from the middle, there's toothpaste on both sides. We we don't want that to happen. Um, most food leaves the stomach, again, like I said, between two to six hours. Um, the carbohydrates are going to leave first, then the proteins, then the fats. This is how they get digested, which we'll talk a little more about that later. The chyme is a thin liquid which leaves the stomach and enters into the duodenum, which is the first part of the small intestine. Now, before we move on, I want to talk to you briefly about something that's kind of a little uncomfortable to talk about, which is vomiting. Um, vomiting is not something that we enjoy doing, and it actually is uncomfortable because food should move in one direction. However, there are times when something gets into the stomach that irritates it or something happens that we end up sending it back the wrong direction. So this could be due to a noxious material you ingested, like something bad you took in, like a poison, or um, you drank spoiled milk, or something like that that irritates the stomach which then causes it to um, come up this could be due to like food poisoning or like the stomach bug or something like that um, there could also be a neural stimuli like you saw something that made your stomach turn and made you need to vomit dizziness uh, if you've ridden like the teacups at Disney World or the tilt a roll at a fair rodeo going so fast it makes you so dizzy that it makes you sick um, certain drugs, that's why they'll put on the, the label that it could cause vomiting. Um, there's also a number of other things that could cause you to vomit that has a neural stimulus. Um, this is going to stimulate the vomiting center that's part of the medulla that's part of your brain stem. Um, the motor output causes the opening of the esophageal sphincters, so the, esoph the esophagus is going to open up to allow the food to for be forcefully pushed back out, and this is going to be a contraction of the diaphragm muscle, which is going to help you with breathing, and also your abdominal muscles. So this is why if you've gotten sick and you've vomited a lot over a period of time, it, it actually causes soreness in the abdominal area because those muscles are being used to force out um, force out the fluid and, and, and the food in the wrong direction. Before we end up talking about the small intestine, I think it's important to talk about some of the accessory organs that help the small intestine be successful in what it does. Um, and the first one is the pancreas. The pancreas is considered retroperitoneal. It's behind the peritoneum. It's posterior and, and lower than the stomach. Um, it has kind of three main regions to it. It has the head of the pancreas, which is the right larger end, which is, comes in contact with the duodenum of the small intestine. We have the body, which is the central portion, and then the tail, which is um, the left side, to the left side of the abdomen. The pancreas is connected to the duodenum by two ducts. Um, these are called the pancreatic accessory ducts, and they're going to help um, take the fluids that the pancreas makes and put them into the small intestine. Um, if you'll recall back from the endocrine chapter, we talked about tiny patches of cells that were called the pancreatic isolates. Remember, they have alpha cells which can that which release glucagon, which is a hormone that raises blood glucose, beta cells which release insulin, which lowers blood glucose, and delta cells, which releases an inhibiting hormone. The whole point is to inhibit alpha and beta cells, and, and especially once you eat something, because it doesn't know how much sugar is actually going to be present in that, and so we want to inhibit the release of either glucagon or insulin until we know how much sugar is going to be entering into the blood. Um, 
Now, this is only a small portion of the pancreas that was part of the endocrine system. We see 99% of the pancreas cells actually play a role in digestion. These are called the aconine cells or the exocrine cells. They secrete what we call pancreatic juice. Now, pancreatic juice, guys, has a lot of stuff in it. It has pancreatic amylase, which is going to break down sugars some more. Um, we see trypsin, chymotrypsin, carboxypeptidase. Um, these are all types of enzymes that are going to break down proteins. We have pancreatic lipase, which is going to help break down and digest fats, ribonuclease and deoxyribonuclease, which is going to help digest DNA and RNA, which are nucleic acids. Um, so we have lots of enzymes who are going to play a role in digestion. However, we also see pancreatic juice contains a lot of sodium bicarbonate. This is really important because it's going to raise the pH. When the chyme enters into the duodenum, it's just left the stomach and it's very acidic. It's got a pH of 2. The enzymes that are in this pancreatic juice cannot work in those conditions. And so what it releases is a sodium bicarbonate to make it slightly alkaline and bring up the pH to 7 to 8 so that they can activate the pancreatic enzymes but inhibit the stomach enzymes like pepsin. Now, the pancreas is also controlled with the secretions based on the nervous system and other hormones. Um, the parasympathetic, remember, is going to be the rest and digest, so it's going to increase these activities. The sympathetic is the, the fight or flight, so it's going to decrease the activities. Um, <clears throat> entrance of acidic chyme from the stomach into the duodenum stimulates secretion of those digestive hormones we talked about with the CCK and the secretin. These are going to also stimulate the pancreas to release their secretions in order to neutralize the acid and deliver the enzymes needed for digestion. The next accessory organ we want to talk about is the liver, and it's the second largest organ in your body. Your first largest organ is your skin. The second would be your liver. It fills up most of the right hypochondriac and part of your epigastric region of your abdominal pelvic cavity. So guys, it takes up a major portion of the right side of your upper abdominal area um, when we look at the liver. Um, it has a large right lobe and a small left lobe. Um, they are positioned below uh, or behind, they're positioned behind the lower sternum, so they're protected a little bit by the rib cage. And we look at this. Um, the liver has a double blood supply. Now, this is unique um, because the liver, and when we talk about its jobs, you're going to see why it has this. But it has a hepatic artery, which is going to be delivering oxygen to the liver cells. It also has an hepatic portal vein. This vein is coming from the other um, organs of the digestive system, from the stomach, the small intestine, the large intestine, and it's going to be bringing in the nutrients. So the liver actually gets first choice and first look at all the nutrients you take into your body. All the blood that is going to leave the liver eventually through the hepatic vein into the IVC, which is the inferior vena cava. The inferior vena cava is the large blood vessel that returns the blood from the lower part of the body to the heart. Now, the liver does have some lobes to it. Um, in these lobes, you're going to find lobules. Each lobule is going to contain hepatocytes. Hepato means liver, site means cells. It's also going to have what we call sizenoids. Sizenoids are where capillaries, um, that's the smallest blood vessels, actually have holes in them to allow passage of more nutrients and stuff. It's kind of like buying those shirts nowadays that have the giant holes already put in them. Um, instead of making them yourself. Um, that's what kind of the sizenoids have. We also see there's RE cells or what we call comfort cells. These are going to help with um, breaking down old red blood cells or they have like an immune system type um, response. Um, we also see that there's going to be the vein, the main vein in the middle that's going to help drain the blood away. Um, hepatocytes also, when we look at them, they're arranged in sheets around and they radiate around that central vein. Um, they also are responsible for producing bile. So the guys, bile is actually made in the liver, but it is stored in the gallbladder. All right, so the liver makes the bile, but it's stored in the gallbladder. Well, what is bile? Bile has two kind of functions. It's partially a digestive secretion, and the whole point of it is to emulsify triglycerides. We want to break down the fats. However, fats are um, hydrophobic. They don't like water. And so in order to break them down, we need some help. And so bile helps emulsify that triglyceride so it can be broken down more. 
Um, it also is partially an excretory product. It helps get rid of bilirubin and other waste products. Now, bilirubin is a waste product from red blood cells. When red blood cells get old and they no longer serve a purpose, we break them down and we recycle most of their parts. Bilirubin is not one of the parts that can be recycled and it must leave the body. It either can leave through the digestive system in the bile, and this is what makes your feces normally brown, or it can leave through the urine, and this is what makes your urine more yellow. Okay, so it can leave the body in these two ways. However, if the bilirubin does not leave the body correctly, it causes what we call jaundice. Jaundice is a yellow pigmentation of the sclera of the eyes, which is the white of the eyes, the skin, and your mucous membranes. This is the buildup of bilirubin into the body um, instead of it being released through the um, excretions of urine or feces. Now, the liver may not be the issue here, and here's a picture showing you normal versus jaundice when you see some coloration. Um, it could be what we call prehepatic jaundice. Pre means before, hepatic means liver. So this is before it even gets to the liver. This is a hemolytic disease, meaning the blood itself has an issue. The blood cells may be bursting and releasing the bilirubin before the stomach or before the liver even has a chance to process it. If it's hepatic jaundice, then it's the liver itself that's the issue. This is due to liver disease like cirrhosis of the liver. If you're a, if a chronic drug user or alcoholic, it could be due to liver cancer or like something like hepatitis C, something like that. Uh, Post-hepatic jaundice is after the liver. The liver did its job, but then the bilirubin couldn't leave in, enter into the intestine like it was supposed to. And so this is normally obstructive jaundice and it's normally due to a blockage of the bile duct. And this is this could be due to like gallstones or something like that. So when we look at the functions of the liver, it's really important for us to note that the liver is going to get first choice of looking at everything that comes through. It's going to look at the sugars that have been metabolized, the lipids and the proteins, and it's going to check them to make sure that they're what are needed um, and remove any kind of danger that might be coming through. So the liver removes and detoxifies certain drugs and hormones from our blood as they move through. Um, this is why... Um, like Motrin and Aleve and some of those things were taken off the market for a while and then they were put back on with um, stricter kind of um, warnings about how it could cause liver issues if not taken as prescribed because they they're in any kind of medication we take there's going to be some stuff that's not very good for us and the liver is going to help get rid of that and as long as you take it as directed it normally doesn't cause any kind of issue the issue does come however if um, you do not, if you abuse it and do not take it as directed. The liver also removes the bilirubin. We already talked about that from the body. Bile salts are necessary for the fat breakdown. Um, the liver also will store certain vitamins like A, B12, D, E, and K. It also stores minerals like ferritin. This is how we store iron. Okay, iron is needed for your blood. Copper, other metals like nickel. If anytime you've looked at a label like of um, a nutritional label, you might notice that there seems to be some weird stuff in there that are like metals and things like that on the periodic table. Well, those are needed a lot of times for enzymes to work properly, and the liver is going to help store those. Um, the comfort cells that are found in the liver are phagocytic. They're going to help break down and remove any worn out blood cells that come through um, and anything else that shouldn't belong. And the liver is also involved in activating vitamin D along with the kidneys and the skin okay so the liver plays like many roles this is why when somebody has liver disease or liver cancer it can cause such a huge problem because the liver does perform so many jobs now before we move into the small intestine we need to look at the gallbladder the gallbladder is a sac that's located in the fossa it's kind of an indention on the back side of the liver the gallbladder stores and concentrates the bile um, so that it can be used and be injected through the common bile duct into the small intestine when it's stimulated by the hormone CCK. Now, you've noticed so far we've talked about several types of hormones that are part of the digestive system. There is a summary of these in a chart in your um, book. However, the table is marked wrong here in the notes, and I didn't catch that before I did the recording. So if you will change that to table 24.8, and if you have the 14th edition of the book, it is found on page 931. Um, take a look at these four different hormones and what they actually do um, for the digestive system and the different accessory organs and um, how they play a role. 
All right, so now we're going to take a look at the small intestine. With the small intestine, it has three main regions to it. The first is the duodenum, this is the top end, which connects to the pyloric sphincter. This is approximately about 10 inches long. You then have the jejunum. The jejunum is gonna be the middle portion. This portion is about three feet long. And then the ileum, which is the lower end, it connects to the large intestine at what we call the ileocecal sphincter. This area is about six feet long. So if you add that together, six plus three is nine, 10 inches is close to a foot, so you're looking at about 10 feet of small intestine. Um, none of us are nowhere near 10 feet tall, and so because of this, that's why it's wrapped all up tight. Now, a big difference, guys, when you look at this, you're thinking, well, the small intestine is super long. Why isn't it called the large intestine? Okay, so the large and small intestine get named based on their diameter. The small intestine's diameter is a lot smaller than the large intestine's, which diameter is a lot bigger. That's why they are named differently. Um, when we look at the small intestine, it is highly adapted for digestion, but also absorption. It contains lots of glands that produce enzymes and mucus to help move the food, but also to help digest it. It also allows for large surface area. Um, one of the main things the small intestines does is absorption, and so we want a bigger surface area to allow this to happen. So some cells have what we call microvilli or little brush borders that contain enzymes that can help break down things quickly. They also have the villi. Um, if you'll notice, like if this, my hand was a cell, if it was just like this, it, there's only certain areas that could absorb. But if the villi is present and it's spread out, it has a lot more ability to absorb in more areas, so it increases the absorption capability. We also see there's circular folds of the intestinal wall, and you can see that in the picture over here on the right. Where there's lots of folds, this is going to allow, again, for more absorption, allowing the food to come in contact in more places, allowing for the, the highest amount of absorbing the food as po the nutrients as possible. So taking a look at the structure, now let's look at how the small intestine functions. Um, it does do mechanical digestion of moving the food. It does do it in two different ways because it is such a long area. It does it through segments and segmentation where it's going to contraction of the circular muscle and it's going to move one area contracts and relaxes, the next area contracts and relaxes and so on, on down the line. Um, we also see peristalsis continuing with the circular muscles as well as the longitudinal muscles that create more of a wave motion that push the food um, along towards the large intestine. There's a lot of chemical digestion that does occur in the small intestine and this is mostly due to the pancreatic juices that get released. The pancreatic amylase is gonna break down starches into smaller sugars. Maltase is going to break down maltose into two glucose molecules. Sucrase is gonna break down sucrose. Lactase is gonna break down lactose and so on. So if you notice guys, these are all sugars because they end in os. Um, and they are broken down by certain enzymes because they end in ACE. Okay, that's what we're looking at there. Trypsin and chymotrypsin break down proteins into smaller peptides and amino acids. And then the pancreatic lipase breaks down triglycerides into fatty acids and monoglycerides. So just like anything else, this is going to be regulated by a number of things. Um, it's going to have a neural regulation as well as hormone regulation. It's going to have local reflex responses. These are going to be um, due to the presence of the chyme in the, in the food that's present. It's going to allow for segmentation and peristalsis to take place due to kind of almost a reflex, which is a neural thing. Hormones help regulate the motility, like how quickly the food's going to move through and also what secretions are going to be released. Um, the parasympathetic um, impulses are going to increase how quickly this process happens, whereas sympathetic are going to decrease how quickly the motility is. The main thing that the small intestine does is absorption. So we wanna look at how absorption works. Absorption is the passage of end products of digestion from the GI tract into the blood or the lymph fluid. And we'll talk a little bit more about what lymph fluid is later in the, in the um, semester, but it is important to note that blood and lymph are really important. 90% of the absorption from your GI tract is gonna take place here at the small intestine. So this is one of its major roles. Now, how does absorption take place? Um, most of it is passive absorption, meaning that it's going to take no energy in order to do this on the part of the cells. If you'll recall way back when we talk about cells um, in anatomy one, 
there were some different ways that we can move substances. So diffusion is where we move from high to low concentration and the molecules just do this. And so inside the intestine, you're gonna have high numbers of carbs, high numbers of proteins, high numbers of fats, and they're gonna wanna move into an area that has low numbers, which would be the blood. So they're gonna diffuse across. Um, the larger the molecules are, the more help they're gonna need to do this. So remember facilitated diffusion is where they just get help like through a protein or something like that. Um, you'll recall osmosis is the movement of water from high concentration to low concentration. And then though, guys, as we get towards the end of the small intestine though, we've created a gradient where it's not as high to low. Okay, it's more closely um, linked, which means we're not gonna see much movement. But we wanna get as much of the nutrients out as possible. And so this is when active transport will come into play where ATP is used to force and push any extra sugars, any extra amino acids, any extra of nutrients that we could use out um, in order to be able to um, utilize it later. And so we will use some energy in order to get energy for later. Now, when we take a look at this, this kind of takes a little bit of information from chapter 25 because we're not going to really cover 25. If you take nutrition, that's going to cover more of that stuff. But one thing to note, though, is that carbohydrate absorption happens first and it goes directly into the blood. Okay, because this is a water soluble type structure and so it likes water, it goes directly into the blood. Uh, proteins with their amino acids do the same thing. They're absorbed directly into the blood and they're absorbed second. The last thing to be absorbed is the fat. And this is the lipid absorption. Now this is a big deal because fats are really hard um, to travel in water because they don't like it. They're hydrophobic. So some of the short chain fatty acids could be absorbed into the blood capillaries, but they have to be transported by some sort of protein like we saw in the fat soluble hormones. These are called apoproteins. And when they connect to this and they become soluble in the water, um, they are called lipoproteins. And they can be abbreviated as HDL, LDL, or VLDL. Um, this is high density lipid, low density lipid, or very low density lipid. A lot of times these are the ratings for cholesterol, guys. So when we look at cholesterol, depending on which levels are high or low, could cause problems for an individual. Um, the longer chain fatty acids, they're going to be absorbed differently. They're going to be absorbed with what we call misules. They're spheres of fatty acids. Um, they're going to be absorbed as fatty acids plus monoglycerides, and they're going to get reassembled into triglycerides for transport. So we broke them apart, and then we're going to rebuild them into triglycerides for transport. Okay, and these are what we call the colmomicrons. Um, these guys are going to be taken into um, the lymphatic system. They're not going to get to enter directly into the blood. They're going to go into the lymphatic system first. They'll eventually enter into the bloodstream. Um, they might be carried to the liver for some processing, but a lot of times they're going to be deposited in the adipose tissue, which is the fat tissue. Now guys, the small intestine also absorbs most of the water from the food that you take in and also the, the fluids that you take in. They're gonna be absorbed here, plus a lot of ions and vitamins are gonna be absorbed in the small intestine. All right, this brings us to the large intestine. The large intestine a lot of times is known as the colon. However, it has some other parts to it as well that we need to discuss. It has the cecum. The cecum is a blind pouch which hangs below the ileocecal sphincter where the um, small intestine connects to the large. Um, it has what we call the vermiform appendix that comes off this area. This is the coiled tube attached to the cecum. Um, the appendix kind of gets a bad rap. We're not real sure what it does completely. Um, it used to probably have more of a purpose than it does now. However, it can cause major issues if you have appendicitis and it ruptures. It can cause sepsis and even death if it's not taken care of quickly. Then we have the colon. The colon is going to be the major portion of the large intestine and we have the ascending colon, which means it's going up. Um, this is retroperitoneal, so it's behind the peritoneum and it goes up the right side of your abdomen towards your liver. So it's gonna go all the way up towards your liver. Then you have the transverse colon, which means it's gonna go from side to side. This is inside the peritoneum and it goes over the, to the left side of the abdomen. Once it's on the left side, we're gonna see the descending colon where it's gonna come down. This is also retroperitoneal and it's gonna go down to the left iliac crest, which is the top of your left hip bone. 
We then see though it's got to move back towards the midline because that's where it's going to end up towards our rectum and anus. So this is the sigmoid colon. It's inside the peritoneum. It curves medially towards your midline at about S3. That's the sacral three when we look at the column of the vertebrae. All right, as we're coming in here. This then leads us to the rectum. This is anterior to your sacrum and your coccyx. And then the anus. The anus is the outer opening of the large intestine. And you have an internal anal sphincter. This is smooth muscle, involuntary. But you also have an external anal sphincter, which is skeletal or voluntary. So sometimes, like, this is a really big deal when we potty train children. And you tell them to hold it. They're going to use that external anal sphincter to help with that. Okay, and there's a training that comes in to play with that for children as they grow up. Now, when we look at the cells and the tissues of the large intestines, you're going to see a big difference between them versus the small intestine. Um, there's no villi, okay, because absorption is not a big thing that's going to be happening here like we saw with the small intestine. There's no circular folds. Um, like the small intestine. It's a flat surface. Um, it's composed of simple columnar epithelial cells. There are a lot of goblet cells which are going to produce a mucus. This is going to help move the feces down to be removed out of the body. There's also very a very large layer of circular and longitudinal muscles here compared to what we saw um, in the small intestine. And they're thicker and the whole point of this is again to help push the feces out of the body. So what takes place in the large intestines? Well, first you have your mechanical digestion that continues, which is just the movement of the substances, the peristalsis. Um, with chemical digestion, there's no enzymes that the large intestine secretes themselves. However, bacterial enzymes do get secreted. Um, the main bacteria that's located in your large intestine is E. coli. This bacteria is going to um, ferment any extra sugars that got left behind. So you're actually helping them out by feeding them. The problem is when they do fermentation, they also release gas. So if you have, if you have gas, it's not actually um, you producing it. It's mostly the bacteria that's producing it, but it has to be released. Um, they catabolize proteins into amino acids even more, and they also take care of the bilirubin, converting it into what we call the stericolumbin. This is going to be what causes your feces to look brown. Uh, bacteria also provides vitamins like B and K to us. Um, more water gets absorbed in the colon, so the liquid chyme becomes more solid or semi-solid um, as we make the feces. Um, more ions and vitamins get absorbed at the colon as well. Because, guys, this is the last chance. Once it leaves the body, it's gone. And so this is kind of the last stitch effort to get anything else out of the um, food that you took in. Any nutrients that are left over that we can get. Now this brings us again to another uncomfortable kind of topic, kind of like vomiting, which is the um, function of defecation or the physiology of defecation or the elimination of waste. This is a reflex action. So once it hits, it is going to be a reflex. There's a little bit of voluntary control, which comes from that external sphincter. Um, However, once we reach the bathroom, there's also some voluntary control from using the diaphragm and the abdominal muscles to help push out the waste. Okay, so you can use your abdominal muscles and diaphragm to help with this. Now, this is similar to what we call the microtrition reflex, which is for urination, which we'll talk about later. All right, the last thing that's in here for the digestive system is the disorders. And I'm not going to really cover these. Um, you will notice at the end of every chapter, there is a um, section about homeostasis and how that system helps with homeostasis with all the others. You should pay close attention to that because this is where we're going to start making lots of connections. Um, this is found for the digestive system on page 933 in the 14th edition of the book. Also, you will see that after that, there's a there talks about the disorders of those particular of those of that particular system. For the digestive system, it talks about tooth decay, um, all the way through ulcers, hepatitis, anorexia. 
so take a look at these different disorders please make sure that you're reading your chapters but this area right here is going to be sometimes the more interesting part um, in anatomy and physiology we're kind of looking at what normal looks like but we also need to see that when you're working in the medical field you're not always seeing the normal you're seeing the abnormal so what does that mean and that's what this area kind of talks about so make sure you read those pages which is 934 and 935 if you have the 14th edition of the book now remember if you have any issues or any concerns as you're going through this going through the notes going through the labs or anything like that please feel free to contact me through canvas um, if you're having any technical issues remember the canvas help desk is open 24 hours a day seven days a week and the number is located in your modules um, have a great day and happy studies